Welcome to Qigong Coaching Clinic, my friends. I want to thank you for taking this time on Saturday because I'm sure you're busy people and have a lot of better things to do than experience Qigong coaching unless you want to experience a transformation or a breakthrough. And this is exactly what Qigong coaching has to offer. I want to acknowledge those of you who are Qigong teachers, Qigong masters, for being here because obviously uh, some of you have dedicated your lives to practicing these internal arts, energy arts. So for example, I see my old friend, Mark Johnson. Thank you, Mark, for being here today. And uh, a few other folks who are uh, well-known or up and coming Qigong masters. So today we are going to explore and experience Qigong coaching. We also will have an opportunity for a few participants to volunteer by raising their hands to occupy the hot seat. If you would like to receive Qigong coaching and enjoy the breakthrough or whatever benefits you would like to experience as a result of receiving a miniature coaching session. It's not gonna be very long. Let's say 10, 15 minutes is reasonable. Some of the folks in attendance are also my apprentices. So I may either step up to the plate myself and provide this coaching or ask some of my apprentices to do the same. And it's gonna be an opportunity for them to practice and also gonna be an opportunity for you, my friends, to experience Qigong coaching on your own skin, so to speak. Now, it's kind of fun and enlightening. I'm saying that because I know this from my own experience. I've been doing this for well over 16, 17 years. I know how uh, this experience can be transformative. And I also would love to offer to you an opportunity to receive it for free today. And that's something that obviously we do on semi-regular basis in our community. So without any further ado, I'm just going to ask, first of all, if anyone has any urgent issues that need to be addressed before we go much further. So if you do have an urgent issue that uh, you would like to address today, don't hesitate to raise your hand. You simply uh, click on participants or in the chat and there's gonna be uh, several buttons to raise your hand. If you're not speaking, I would like you to be muted for the time being. So basically, there's not gonna be any audio interruptions. Now, when you do receive uh, any coaching, obviously you will need to be unmuted, and that's simply uh, a matter of pushing the mute button once again. So, uh, I want to thank you, Marsha, for helping me today. Marsha Adams is uh, one of my apprentices, and she's also a co-facilitator of this event today. So what is Qigong coaching and how can you benefit from it? Well, about 20 years ago, when I was operating Portland Qigong Clinic, which was at that time one of the few Qigong clinics in the United States, I often noticed how people would backslide. They experienced a breakthrough or a transformation right in front of me in the clinic that was wonderful and beneficial. But when they went home, they just defaulted to their habitual way of doing things, the habitual lifestyle, habitual uh, diet, or way of using their bodies or their energies. And so I was wondering why they were not doing the homework that I prescribed them to do. The meditations that I suggested they would practice um, the, the lifestyle changes that I prescribed to them, or uh, some exercises that I advised them that they would do. And I found out that people were not doing the homework because they would forget. They would get distracted by millions of things that everyone does in their lives. That's one of the reasons why people also complain about having difficulty with practicing Qigong or Tai Chi or similar arts. They basically get 
um, distracted by millions of things in, that happen in their lives. And uh, they needed to make their own decisions. And that's exactly what coaching provides. Instead of therapy, I started doing coaching, meaning I started empowering people to make their decisions. I started engaging them in discovering for themselves what worked and what didn't work. And obviously one of the things that they had to discover for themselves is that the old things that they were doing before were likely to bring about the old results. So if they wanted to get better results, they had to do something different. It's a, such a simple and, and obvious thing that it makes total sense to everyone when people start thinking about it. You know, if you want to get better results, you need to do something differently from what you used to do. But that's exactly why therapy didn't have the long lasting effects is because it basically it did not provide the new way of being to, their, to the clients. And so coaching became the solution to this challenge. And that's exactly what coaching does. It literally invites the client to discover a new way of being, a new identity, if you will. That's something that nobody, as far as I know, was offering in Qigong community. And so I basically had to pioneer the new profession of Qigong coaching, the profession that was based on energy principles, but rather than doing forms that most people think of when they think of Qigong. Qigong coaching didn't have any forms. Qigong coaching integrated the principles and then started developing the lifestyle, de developing the ways of moving through life, the culture of movement, as I call it, that allows you to embody the principles of Qigong in your daily life, so much so that you can literally walk your talk. Every step you take on earth becomes an embodiment of your energy awareness and other aspects of Qigong practice that uh, we so cherish and uh, aspire to embody in our bodies. And that's exactly why Qigong coaching works, because we don't just talk the talk. We also integrate these principles into our physical bodies and in our consciousness. So for those of you who have not experienced it, we'll have an opportunity today to actually experience it on your own skin, so to speak. And for those of you who have experienced it, well, I would like to ask you to unmute yourself and take turns to basically share what you experienced as a result of receiving Qigong coaching. Uh, I see there are a few folks here who I know have received Qigong coaching from me in the past or recently. So for example, Marsha, would you do me a favor and uh, unmute yourself for a minute and share with me and with the uh, other folks in our group what you experienced as a result of receiving Qigong coaching? Uh, absolutely. So the very first encounter I had, I'm going to use these terms very delicately. I will say healed an injury that I had in a matter of like 20 minutes that I'd had doctors looking at for years, all kinds of medical bills around with absolutely no resolution. And in a matter of literally 20 minutes, I had results that just amazed me at how well it made a difference. And then in a, in a bigger picture, I mean, I took on becoming a student of it at that time because I was so amazed with it. And over the last however many years it's been, um, the ability to find my own concerns, see the result of bringing energy into my own life. Some places the growth is slower and smaller and some places it's like quantum leaps will occur, but getting in touch with your own energy and your own ability to apply it, just excellent work. Well, and apparently it inspired you not only to benefit for your own sake, but also to learn how to become a Qigong coach so that you would be able to help 
other people experience these benefits as well. Absolutely, absolutely. The, the, um, I didn't know when I was getting connected originally with Lama that it was going to add into my other professional career goals, but the, I, the structure of becoming a coach is something I can apply to all of my practices. So um, there's like nothing that it doesn't apply to, and I'm serious, like it can apply to doing the dishes, or it can apply to being a mental health counselor, which is what my training has been in. It can apply to being an artist. So um, the ability to work with somebody else with those tools, limitless. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Marsha. I want to acknowledge you for being a dedicated uh, explorer of this art and uh, um, also for helping me today as a, our co-host. Absolutely. And, I also see Sean, Sean Hall. Hi, Sean. You may also have something to share with our, our group if you feel like it. Obviously, you've experienced a few years of my coaching by now, so perhaps you have something to share. Thank you. Yes, um, it's a pleasure to be here and, and see all these lovely faces here on, um, on your Saturday morning. So thanks for starting your weekend with, with us. Uh, yeah, it's been a real blessing to be able to study under Lama, and um, it's been a great uh, addition to my coaching. Um, I've basically been able to um, approach from a very body body oriented perspective on the issues that come up for people, and then as far as symptoms are concerned, going from the symptoms that we see physically and connecting the dots so that we can kind of find the underlying cause of the issues that many people are experiencing nowadays. Um, so pain is something that is a, everybody has pain and pain may manifest on the physical level, but then it shows up energetically. It shows up <clears throat> other areas of your life. And it's as soon as we tackle the physical pain, we can start to again unravel and peel the, layers of the onion back and be able to approach um, healing as a holistic approach. So not just trying to focus on symptoms, not using, uh, you can do this without years of therapy and sitting there and just kind of digging the hole deeper um, instead of digging the hole deeper and just kind of splashing in the, in the puddle, so to speak. Um, you actually end up finding ways to, create a new perspective on life and your problems in general. So that once you shift your perspective, you actually begin to find that the problems in fact were learning opportunities, and opportunities to grow. So it's been an amazing uh, journey for me, especially with my own injuries. Cause I, I've had, I've been a yoga teacher for over 10 years and um, had many an uh, injury. It's a myth that yoga, yogis and, and yoga practitioners don't injure themselves because yoga is so good for you. Or even Qigong and Tai Chi um, practitioners. Everybody experiences injury, and it's most likely due to some sort of repetition. And that's what I love so much about uh, this Qigong coaching is uh, we don't – uh, emphasize repetition on forms. Um, it's not a routine you're doing every day. It uh, gives you freedom of choice. So being able to experience that freedom of choice at a very physical level so that you can once again take that on, on an energetic level, um, apply it to your career, your finances, your relationships, your health. Um, yeah, it's it's been a big a, a great uh, platform to launch off of. So I um, really appreciate that. Thank you. I appreciate you saying this, Sean. It's definitely been a pleasure to work with you. You are an, an incredibly coachable person. And that's one of the things that I promised to myself those many years ago, that I would only work with coachable people. So I'm pretty selective about who I choose to work with and those folks who I do choose to work with, by and large, are incredible people and, and amazing practitioners. And one of the amazing practitioners I also want to acknowledge and perhaps uh, give a, 
uh, a microphone to, the talking stick to, is Sirka. Thank you for being here today this morning. Yay, thank you for having me here today. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I, I've been blessed with your coaching, with Qigong coaching for the past, yeah, a few years. And um, I'm a professional singer and vocal coach. And um, well, I've done all kinds of things in my life, <laughs> vocal, a t music teacher, English teacher and stuff like that. Um, and but I actually what I wanted to say, it kind of goes hand in hand with what Marsha talked about that I, um, I finally started really working out and really like losing weight. I was 65 at least, if not 70 pound, pounds heavier four years ago. And, um, and I was like, I finally got into, you know, losing weight. And um, I got, had this health coach and she started talking to me about my emotions too. And back then I was like, oh, okay, this is a very emotional journey. Um, losing weight, you know, it's getting, starting to move your body gets your state of consciousness in a, another place. And I get in touch with feelings I hadn't felt in a long time. However, I pushed myself so hard. So I always hurt after training. I always hurt. So I ended up actually getting a back injury Then I moved to the States and um, met my beautiful husband, who is a yoga teacher. And, uh, and uh, I started doing lots of yoga. And again, this back injury just flared up over and over again. And I was like, isn't this supposed to help me uh, yoga? So I finally, I met Lana and I think it was a matter of a couple of sessions with you. And then I figured out what exactly what was going on in my back, exactly what exercises I couldn't do right now and exactly which exercises I had to back off of in yoga and then even finding better movement for my body in the way that it naturally likes to move. So during curing that back pain, it, it separated into me also curing a lot of emotional beliefs about myself, a lot of stuck energy. It was not just the back. It was, me believing that I, I, um, I had to constantly push myself as a human being in order to get anything done. But then learning from Qigong coaching that, no, I don't. I have to just constantly push the edges of my comfort zone and ride along those edges and see where that takes me rather than try and jump out where the sharks you know, are and they'll probably kill me out in the deep water, right? So um, the whole like, moving away from the big leap and going stepping into the small steps and keep the ball rolling that's my biggest definitely take away from qigong coaching so much so i the first time i met lama was a weekend workshop and i was so excited like my husband sean he brought me with he, with him to your workshop and i had no idea what i was going to experience but my back was better, you know, everything was better. So I took everything I learned that weekend straight home to my practice. And I taught all my, or I coached all my vocal clients through this. And I saw them become better and better and better singers. And, um, and I just was like, so I've been using it in my practice ever since. And then also becoming a Qigong coach because it's so valuable. And now friends and family are starting to ask, like, how do you do that? What do you mean about that? What do you, how do, can, I, can you help me with this? So it, it really, like Marcia said, it, it helps with every area of your life. <laughs> well, I definitely appreciate you very much for uh, being uh, such a, a light at the end of the tunnel for many people, because I know that you work as a coach with many people and basically help them transform their lives. So... Mm -hmm that's one of the principles of Qigong coaching is you want to leverage your work. And that's one of the reasons why I love working with other coaches is because then I don't Im improve the quality of one person at the time. It expands through the work of the person I coach. It also touches the lives of all the people that that coach works with. So basically it has an exponential influence on people in our community. Wonderful. Well, if anyone else wants to speak up, obviously there are a few other folks uh, here uh, in our gathering who received my coaching as well. If you want to, feel free to unmute yourself, raise your hand, and um, say a few words. 
Uh, one of the things um, I see Barbara Lynn, for example, uh, if you feel like it, don't hesitate to unmute yourself and uh, uh, share with uh, our gathering anything about your experience of receiving Qigong coaching, which you received for a few years. Well, I, I just arrived, so I don't really know what people have been talking about. Um, I, um, well, I found it invaluable for a lot of reasons. Um, it helped me uh, to ground better. I was already grounded, but it, it helped me to ground better. It also helped me to work with energy uh, differently. You know, I'm a spiritual healer, so I work with energy all the time. But this helped me to perceive, just perceive energy differently and work with it differently in my life. It also helped me to the exercises in terms of um, strength and endurance training. Uh, that has really helped my upper body and my triceps, biceps area, obviously my legs too, but uh, as you age, I'm going to turn 70 uh, in a month, which is hard to believe, but you know, as you age, you're, uh, especially with women, your triceps start sagging, and I decided that is not going to be me. So uh, those exercises you gave were invaluable for that. Um, also, I, you know, I've been working on myself for a lifetime in my inner work and the work I did with you uh, really uh, allowed me to go through and heal um, the last remaining issues that I had uh, so you really touch on a lot of different things, you know, you bring everything back into your body, whereas in spiritual healing and working with energy work, um, although grounding is really important, uh, you know, you tend to space out a lot. Uh, so that helped me not to space out as much, you know, I know my internal process that I was dealing with. It also helped to, well, it helped to balance my path out because I was dealing with an extremely yin path, which is one of surrender, total surrender to spirit. So that uh, basically, basically within that, living in a state of grace where everything is brought to me. Whereas your path is I create my own reality. So it's balancing both of those paths together, you know, extreme yin, extreme yang. There is a balance in the middle there. So anyway, I'm sure there are loads of other things, but that's what I can think of on the top of my head. Thank you so much, Barbara Lynn. I want to acknowledge you for being an amazing spiritual healer. Uh, if anyone ever needs spiritual healing, I would definitely recommend experiencing Barbara Lynn's work and uh, uh, is obviously something that uh, is very much in alignment with the principles of Qigong coaching. But of course, everybody who studies Qigong coaching also learns how to apply it in their own way, uh, basically creating their own signature application or signature program or um, a unique way of basically serving other people. So I just want to thank you for serving uh, your community so well for so many years. Thank you. And uh, I would like to invite anyone who has any issues, any challenges, any aspirations that you need help with to raise your hand and basically volunteer to receive a short, maybe 10, 15 minute long, Qigong coaching session. Obviously, you'll be in the hot seat, so you will uh, not have the privacy of a one on one coaching. So, if you want to receive uh, coaching in privacy of a one on one uh, coaching session, 
obviously this would not be the appropriate time for that. But if you have some relatively a simple issue that is not a, much of a concern in terms of privacy or something perhaps hurts or something perhaps that bothers you energetically or some Qigong or Tai Chi techniques that don't work for you, bring them up. I see that uh, Robert Donnan has just raised your hand. Feel free to turn your camera on, unmute yourself, Robert, and uh, tell me what uh, you're experiencing and what you'd like to uh, experience breakthrough in. Hi there, Lama Tantrapa. I'm, I'm actually uh, zooming in from Eastern Kentucky in a very rural place. So if I turn on my video, you'll, we'll lose connection. Is that, uh, can, may I continue anyway, or? Yeah, go ahead, please. Okay. So uh, in October, I was hiking, slipped and fell, and broke my ulnar in my left forearm. Uh, mm -hmm. I had surgery about a week later. And since then, I've been recovering slowly, but I've encountered some issues. Uh, the first is, is that my hand, my left hand was apparently injured in the fall. And uh, currently, I can't, I can't make a fist. I can, my fingers are stiff. I'm a musician, a, a songwriter, but also I practice Qigong. I'm a writer. Uh, I do uh, Shiatsu massage, many things that involve my hand. And so that's, it's, it's just recovering very slowly. There's no structural damage. I've had an MRI and so I'm doing therapy. The collateral and, uh, stuff going on with this is that I've, I, because I had a urinary catheter during the surgery, I've had recurrent UTIs ever since. And so my, it's kind of just, I feel like I'm in a state of uh, depletion. So I, I do practice Qigong, uh, not as often as I wish, um, but I have studied for a number of years in the healing Tao uh, tradition with Michael Wen. So anyway, um, I, I ran across your thing today after deciding that I needed to dedicate the weekend to getting back on track. So I, whatever coaching you might offer, I'm here to, to, to absorb it. Well, great. I definitely uh, understand that you experienced a, a trauma of, of the bone called ulna in the lower arm. You said left arm. And yes. also traumatized your hand to the extent that you cannot flex the fist. And uh, if it's not uh, the issue with bones, then obviously it's the soft tissue of tension that is causing this disability. Right. Because I can't see you, uh, I cannot really make an assessment of how much mobility you have in your hand. So please uh, describe it with your words how much mobility you have in your hands. Do you have an ability to at least flex and, and extend your fingers this much like I'm doing right now? Okay, so the thumb is the most flexible. The little finger is somewhat flexible. The, mm -hmm. the index, middle, and ring fingers are very, very stiff. And the tendons are connected. That's what the MRI was showing. But there's just, I don't, I mean, I don't know the surgeon said he didn't know, but he said surgery was not the course, but that I should pursue another path. This just happened this past week. Makes total sense. Yeah, definitely surgery would just adding more trauma to your body. Essentially what happens is that there are flexors and extensors of fingers. Are you familiar with these terms? Yes. All right, so what do flexors do? Oh, well, the, the flexors, as I understand it, are connected in the forearm and they allow us to curl the fingers. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. That flexion. Basically, flexing the fist or clenching the fist is exactly what flexors do. And what do extensors do? And I think that's more allowing the fingers to spread, like if I were waving or, yes, like that. Yeah. Basically, straightening the fingers is what extensors do. Very good. Having this knowledge is very important because the extensors, in your particular case, preventing the, fl uh, the fist to flex all the way or to clench the fist all the way. Yeah, I can't, I can't really 
flex at all right now. It's just very minute movement in the tips of the fingers. Just like yeah. this? Like that, if, yeah, about, if that much. Yeah, um, so let me ask you to use the other hand. Okay. And bring the fingers of the other hand to uh, wrap the hand around the elbow. Okay. Just like this. Got like it. This. Yes. And with the fingers, as if you're playing a musical instrument. For example, I spent eight years studying violin in music school. So this is almost like playing violin, just like holding the uh, neck of a violin, except instead of the left hand, you're going to use the right hand. Gotcha. And I want to palpate the forearm real close to the elbow joint and tell me if it's sore or tender to touch. Uh, not really. I mean, that part, that part has, it was a dislocated fracture, but that part has healed very, very well, I think. And I'm not experiencing pain or even, I think if I hit an acupressure point, I can feel a sensitivity, but other than that, nothing more than I would expect from just a, a point along a meridian. Okay. So as you're holding your right hand by your left elbow, I invite you to wiggle your fingers to the extent you can. You said that you can flex them a little bit and extend them a little bit. So please do that. And tell me if the right hand fingers feel the movement of the muscles. Yes. Under the pressure. Yes. yes, they do. So then what I want you to do next is to walk the right fingers using mostly probably the index and middle fingers. Okay. Farther away from the wrist towards the elbow joint. Close to the elbow joint is the origin of the extensors. And you will feel how there may be a tender point real close to the joint. So yes. I refer to it as a, a tennis elbow when it hurts or when this muscle is going to spasm, that's basically where it's going to hurt the most. Feel the tenderness? Yes, I do. Very well. Now, what I will invite you to do next is something really funny. I'm going to just ask you to rest your chin on your hand, just in the way that you can see me doing right now. Basically pressing on the fingers in such a way that they extend it all the way. At the same time, with the fingers of the right hand, I invite you to apply pressure on the tender point and make sure to apply pressure mindfully, not to push yourself over the edge of your comfort zone completely, but just to bring yourself to the edge of the comfort zone in terms of intensity of pressure. Can you do that? I can, although I'm not as successful as you are in getting my left hand to lie flat under my chin. I can get it, I can sit, sit it in the heel of my palm. Oh, but you want me to do it on the... I, I want you to apply pressure with your chin on your index fingers. I'm gonna jokingly call this a chin knot treatment. <laughs> um, okay. I mean, it's a little awkward and I'm not getting it totally, I'm not getting my hand to go parallel to the desk or whatever, but I can, I'm putting That's pressure. That's not a requirement. The requirement okay. is to extend the fingers to the, to the degree that you can. Yes. And not push yourself over the edge in any way. Okay. Meaning in terms of extension of the fingers, in terms of extension of the wrist, in terms of applying pressure on the origin of the extensor muscles. Just enough pressure to feel like, yeah, I, I definitely sense it. Yeah, I feel it. Now let's make sure that you also apply pressure in the direction away from the elbow towards the wrist. Okay. So basically it's a pressure that is not applied perpendicular to the surface of the skin, but at an angle, about 45 degrees angle. And see how you can apply pressure towards the wrist. So basically what you're doing is you are shortening your extensors. Does it make sense? Yes. Great. You're shortening your extensors and you're making sure that you're doing that within the uh, confines of the comfort zone. 
but you basically will want to simply hold that pressure on the extensors for about a minute, minute and a half, maybe two minutes. So okay. uh, you, you see me moving around. I don't want you to move around. I want you to just continuously apply pressure and wait. What are we going to wait for? We're going to wait for a change in your breathing pattern. Your breathing pattern will change, becoming deeper and smoother, when your central nervous system will realize, I don't have to send so many signals of contraction to this extensor muscle. Mm. Obviously, muscle is not stupid. It's not going to hold tension for no good reason. Instead, it holds chronic tension and has been holding tension apparently for a number of months now because it receives signals of contraction from your central nervous system. Interestingly enough, these are not conscious signals. Your central nervous system is kind of agitated and send these signals unconsciously. And you can't stop doing it because you're not aware of it. You don't know that you're doing it, so you can't stop doing it. However, when you shorten this muscle, like we're just doing, in a relatively passive manner, you allow this muscle to basically achieve what it's been trying to achieve. When the muscle is contracting, what is it trying to achieve? It's trying to bring the two ends of the muscle closer together, basically. Yeah. That's the dream of this muscle that is trying to manifest. And what you're doing is you're helping it manifest its dream. You literally are shortening the extensor muscle and applying pressure on origin of it. So the origin and insertion of it are being brought closer together in a passive manner. The muscle doesn't have, even have to work. So it will actually communicate to the central nervous system. Mission success. I've been trying to figure out how to bring the two ends of the muscle closer together for a long time. And now I've done it. Or somebody came along and helped me out and basically helped me achieve this, what I've been trying to achieve. And it's going to take the central nervous system a little bit of time to comprehend what happened. And then it will realize that it doesn't have to send so many signals of contraction to this muscle anymore because it doesn't require it any longer. And when the central nervous system doesn't send the signals to contract to this muscle, what's going to do? Relax. It's going to start relaxing. And when it starts relaxing, it will be able to lengthen. So once you notice the sigh relief or another change in the breathing pattern, or may even start yawning, I can see you, so I can tell, you'll have to basically monitor your own breath. Gotcha. Not to do this to your breath, but just to watch how the breath changes spontaneously. That's the really important thing. We use the breath as the gauge of when the central nervous system becomes less agitated and starts sending fewer signals of contraction to the muscles. And it's going to do it not only in relation to this particular muscle in question, but to many other muscles in the body, including the breathing muscle, your diaphragm. And so as a result, your breathing pattern will change. That basically is how it works, the mechanics of it. But we don't have to know all the details, all the mechanics. We just simply know that by helping this part of the body manifest its dream, the whole body will benefit. Mm. And the more parts of ourselves will help manifest and live their dreams, the more they come together to help us manifest and live our dreams. Thank you so much. That, that makes perfect sense to me. <laughs> Great. Now, since I can't see you, Robert, please tell me if you have already experienced the release. Yes. I, I, it's, it's subtle, but I could tell there was a shift in my breathing. Very nice. So then you can simply stop pressing with your chin on your fingers mm -hmm. and allow them to move on their own. When there is less tension, there's going to be more movement. In other words, tension is frozen movement. And when tension is no more or it subsides, the movement becomes possible or flows more freely. 
So if you just do me a favor and wiggle your fingers, do you notice any difference in the range of motion of the fingers? Uh, yes, the tips of the fingers are freer. And it doesn't feel as stiff, it feels more energized. Wonderful. That means that the tension that used to create an energy blockage doesn't create as much of an energy blockage. Obviously, uh, energy blockages leave the hand deficient in terms of their capability. It's yeah. like if you're a musician or if you're an artist or if you're a healer or anyone who works with the hands, well, you need to be able to send energy to your hands. If you, energy doesn't make it to the hand because of the energy blockage somewhere in the forearm or upper arm, well, there's not going to be much function in the hand. Gotcha. That also may tell you that you are on the right track. In other words, you do something and it gives you certain improvement. Now, let me ask you this. If you repeat this, do you think it's going to have an accumulative effect? I'm sure it will because um, energetically the hand has felt, for quite a while it felt dissociated, like as, it, as if it were not part of my energy body. That has been returning, but I can see that this exercise will promote that further integration of the energy flow in the hand and, and forearm back into the rest of me. Absolutely. That's exactly what we do this for. We reconnect with certain parts of ourselves that basically got disconnected. And one of the benefits of reconnection, obviously, is greater ability to move this part of the body consciously. Yeah. So in order to be able to consciously enjoy this movement, obviously, you would have to develop uh, some way of experimenting what I can do with this hand. Now, what kind of music do you play? What kind of music do you play? I play guitar. You play with the left hand holding the guitar neck? Yes. The, my left hand has been something of a genius, uh -huh. far smarter than me, because over the last four or five years, I've written about 1,500 songs, all of which led by the gift, my gifted left hand. Hmm. So... It, I honestly have wanted to allow it to heal in whatever way it needs to, not to have to prove anything to me, but just to rejoin this creative process. Right on. Yeah, and that's exactly what you can also use as a gauge in terms of how function returns to your hand. Basically, picking up the guitar and just experimenting what is possible. And you use guitar as the feedback mechanism. How much improvement you experience, just don't overuse it, basically. It's, a, it's possible to overuse even playing guitar, right? Yeah, well, well just now, I, I can't play at all. Um, but I can hold the guitar and I can just let it do what it will for now. So connecting with this hand and allowing of the fingers to basically find what they can do. Yeah. And basically measure how well you are doing that. Okay. And then as you progress day after day, you will be able to you know, track your results. Basically it's easier to improve that which you measure. If you don't measure, often you don't really know how much you improve. Make sense? Gotcha. It right. does. Because you're so uh, familiar with the function of your left hand as, as a musician, I'm sure you will be able to gauge very precisely both the strength and also the mobility of your fingers. And once you regain mobility, we'll need to work on strength because obviously you have lost some of that strength, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. So well, thank you. that's something that I would definitely encourage you to experience either working with myself or with uh, one of my apprentices. There are a few more apprentices of mine who've just uh, joined us in. Uh, for example, Yoav Shor uh, from Israel. Um, he is a wonderful uh, Qigong coach in training. Um, and a few other folks. Um, basically, we can help you with that. Great. Thank you. I appreciate it. 
you are so welcome. Thank you for sharing with us what you've been dealing with and, and being open to receive uh, Qigong coaching today. Anyone else would like to raise a hand and uh, request a, a complimentary uh, coaching session? It's not going to be a full-fledged session for a whole hour. It's going to be a relatively brief one, but it's going to be a very essential because we're not going to beat around the bush. We're going to go straight to the heart of the matter, so to speak. That's one of my superpowers, and that's something that I would like you to experience as well. Hi, Stephanie. Hello. Where are you calling from? I'm in Hollywood. <laughs> Hollywood, California? Hollywood, California, yes. Marvelous. Yeah. Are you an actress? No. <laughs> well, a lot of people in Hollywood are involved in the movie industry. So you've got to ask. And I've no, I'm more of a journalist, art writer, and I've been practicing Tai Chi for over 25 years, I think. Marvelous. Various Qigongs along the way. Uh -huh. And um, I've had some extreme health events happen to me, which we won't go into. But I think I have a nice little problem to share today, which hopefully will amuse everybody. <laughs> uh, okay. Please. Uh, okay. So um, about a couple of years ago, more or less, somebody recommended a massage therapist to me. And I thought, oh, that sounds very good. I could definitely use a good massage. And he was supposed to have some special techniques. Mm -hmm. So he came over and um, um, did, did some massage uh, movements on me. And then at some point, I was lying on my back. And he said, relax. And to my shock and horror, he grabbed my head and yanked the hell out of it. <laughs> like that. And... Um, that was just the worst thing. Uh, I never knew he was going to do anything like that. He never said he would. He didn't ask for my permission, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Worst case scenario. Now, it so happened that I have a very delicate neck because in 97, I was clobbered by um, an airbag explosion in my face, which should not have occurred. So I had, at that time, um, neck damage, brain damage, the whole thing, which I, you know, worked, worked out of with the help of Tai Chi mostly, actually, and acupuncture stuff. So anyways, I don't like anybody mess with my neck. So I was terrified when that happened. I actually almost, I jumped out of my body, I think. And so the question then was, you know, how much damage is there? It wasn't too, too bad, but uh, on my right side, um, at the occiput, Putal bone, which you know, we have these two bones in the back of the head, these two knobs. So, on the right side, the nerve was really pinched. Mm. And I tried to have some chiropractic, but it wasn't very successful. Um, I've done what did I do? I, yes, I, I was given conventional um, therapy exercises to do by a physical therapist. That helped actually open it up a bit, um, but it's still somewhat stuck. And the, the, the biggest problem really is pressure on the circulation. Um, so from this point up to, you know, the right side of the brain, the temple, and this, this area mm. <laughs> contributing to me probably being really more dumb than usual. So, um, so um, it's, the tightness comes and goes, but it has remained stuck. So, you know, I, I always think, well, it, eventually I'll get a, you know, I'll get, uh, I'll get progress. I do know one uh, amazing chiropractor, but he has not wanted to wear masks and stuff like that. He thinks God protects him. So I haven't been able to see him <laughs> because I don't feel I'm particularly protected. <laughs> So anyway, so if there's anything um, we can do to open up this, this, this area, do you understand exactly where that is? I know exactly where occiput is. I yeah, that, it's a knob, yeah. Thank that you. You're talking about uh, most likely the first or the second cervical vertebra that either got sublexed or dislocated as a result of the cranking that the massage therapist did to your neck. 
most likely it also caused uh, some degree of spasm in the muscles of the neck because the body that's not used to experiencing this kind of whiplash tried to prevent more damage from happening. Well, how does the body try to prevent it from happening? By Attraction. and creating more tension. Yeah. That's exactly what happens when you experience, for example, a whiplash in a car accident. In other words, if there is a sudden uh, abrupt stop, your head that is not strapped to the seat basically will go like this. And the muscles of the back of the neck will try to keep that from happening too much. And they will go into a spasm. And that's exactly how we develop whiplash or similar uh, type of um, sprain type of conditions. So very likely that you got your neck sprained by that massage therapist. And let me ask you to do this. Can you turn sideways towards the webcam like this? Uh, this way? Yes. And okay. um, yeah, also would you move your hair so I can see the uh, outline of your neck? I can tie it. Please. Yeah, I can tell you. Hang on one second. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> there we go. We're ready. We're, we've got the props. Is that good? Yeah, yes, very nice. Okay. okay. So, um, is this how you usually hold your head in your daily life? Like? I think so. Uh, okay. Yeah, I, I tend to hold myself pretty straight. That's a habit that became very uh, crucial after that accident in 97, you know, to stay straight, not let anything fall, fall off, really. <laughs> All right. So yeah. uh, this is how you feel, like you're holding yourself straight? Yes, I, I do feel that way, yeah. Okay. Well, that means that there is proprioceptive uh, kinest, um, lack of kinesthesia. In other words, if I straighten your body, you would not feel straight. You would feel crooked. Ah. Now, when you hold yourself the way you hold yourself, you feel straight. But it isn't, I promise you, because <laughs> Okay. If I emulate the way that you hold yourself, it will look about so. Oh. Okay. Now, if I keep doing this to myself for an extended period of time, let's say a year or several years or a decade, when did this happen to you, that uh, muscle, misalignment or malalignment of your neck? Um, by, by, the, by this therapist guy. Uh, two and a half years ago. Yeah. So if I do this for two and a half years, do you think I will have some tension in my neck? Well, yes. Uh, I would say more, <laughs> more here probably in the trapezius, but yes. It's going to be trapezius. Well, basically, the weight of the head is quite substantial. It's about 12, 13 pounds for <laughs> most people, depending on how much hair you have, how many gold teeth you have. <laughs> uh, but uh, that's like a weight of a, a heavy bowling ball, right? The size of the first cervical vertebra is about the size of a pinky. Really? Uh huh. Huh. And the second vertebra is not much bigger, and so on and so forth. Basically, the further down they go, the lar larger they become. But way up there, the vertebra that connect to the skull proper are relatively small. So imagine balancing a bowling ball on a pinky. Uh. <laughs> that would be quite challenging, right? But yeah. possible. If the bone, uh, bones of the pinky are all in alignment, then it's not going to be that big of a deal. If there is any misalignment, like you stick the pinky into the hole in a bowling ball, and then do this with a pinky, oh. that's going to be very difficult to hold up the bowling ball, right? But that's what your neck is experiencing. Ah, oh, okay. And it's not something that starts with the neck. I mean. The injury started at the neck, at neck level. But there must be a reason why that massage therapist was even doing that to your neck. I don't know his reasons, but there was... <laughs> it's a dark mystery that we do not want to explore. <laughs> right. 
but there must have been something that attracted his attention to your neck. There must have been some tension already. Okay. And usually the chain breaks at the weakest link, as they say. Mm. In other words, whichever part of your body was already compromised and tense, that's most likely where the injury is going to occur. In other words, in this culture, a lot of people confuse tension for strength. And they think that if I'm holding tension, I'm strong. Well, that's quite opposite. <laughs> where there is tension, there is weakness. As I was working with Robert just a few minutes ago, mm. we were exploring how tension in the extensor muscles was basically creating disability in his hand. Well, you're experiencing tension in the extensors of the cervical spine. And these are not just extensors of the cervical spine. They go all the way down to your sacrum. It's the same muscle group right. called rectus spinet. And that basically is the longest muscle group in the body. It goes on both sides of the spinous processes, all the way from the occiput down to the sacrum. It has several segments, so it's not like the muscle fibers are all um, long like this, but it's a muscle group that is basically going to hold tension not only in one place, but the, throughout the entire length. So, interestingly enough, we need to begin working on this issue at the other end first. <laughs> okay. The other end is closer to the pelvis. And pelvis and the sacrum are a foundation of the spine. So if we work with the foundation, it will affect everything going on upstairs. If we try to just fix whatever is going on upstairs, but the foundation is still misaligned, and I promise you it's misaligned in a very particular way, and that's exactly why there is tension in the rectus spinae muscle. Wow. What is the misalignment of the pelvis? Well, it is tilted anteriorly or forward. Uh, basically, if you just do me a favor and stand up on your feet for a moment. And okay. just jump and land softly like so. Jump? Yes, please. <laughs> Okay, just jump land and land once. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, you landed. Great. Okay. It, without moving whatsoever, I invite you to bring attention to your feet and tell me which part of the f feet uh, receives more weight of your body, the front or the back, the toes or the heels? Poof, you know, <laughs> actually the middle, uh, the middle. The middle, the middle of the foot. So the middle and a little bit towards the back, but more the middle. Okay. So what I invite you to do next is to explore shifting the weight forward towards the toes and notice how it affects your neck. What happens to your neck and your head? Let me do that again. I think it lighten it, it lightens it a little bit. The, 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 the pressure is not as strong. Okay. And let's come back to the middle of the foot. Okay. Nice. And let's bring more weight now onto the heels. Mm. And notice how it affects your neck again. Maybe a little lengthening. Lengthening. Very nice. Bit. So, Let's bring the weight back to the center of the foot. Okay. Basically what's going on is the more your weight is on to the toes of your feet or the balls of your feet, the more there's going to be this jutting of the head forward. It's ah. holding forth posture. Mm. And if I shift my weight towards the center, I become more upright. If mm. I bring the weight towards the heels, I will be holding back. Now there's going to be tension in the front of my throat. And when I bring the weight to the center again, I again become more upright. It has effect on your hips too. 
So the next thing we're going to do is I'm going to ask you to do me a favor and tilt your pelvis forward, like you perk up your tail, like so. Yes, like it, you bring your tail a little bit higher up. Okay, so I'm going to just so we can understand. Yeah, just like so. Hang on. So this way. Yes. Like that. Exactly. Okay, like. This is how it affects your neck. Uh, can't quite. I th I think there's less tension, but it's it's subtle, so. Okay, and let's bring the pelvis to neutral. Very well. And now let's tilt the pelvis in the opposite direction, like you're tucking your tailbone. Like a lot of Tai Chi teachers, for some reason, tell their students, tuck your tailbone, tuck your tailbone. Well, so. They overdo that. <laughs> yeah. So let's see if you can do that. Okay. Tuck your tailbone and notice how it affects your neck again. That actually feels more, more, more contracted. More tension. Okay, so yeah. now we know that the movement of the pelvis and also the change in distribution of weight on your feet has immediate effect on the tension on your neck. If I just jump through right. the computer screen and heal your neck, it's not going <laughs> to stay relaxed because it will backslide into habitual pattern of tension that happens throughout your whole body. Mm. And now you know that this pattern of tension is not something that you have to be stuck in. You actually have the freedom of choice as to whether to keep it or to experiment with it. Does that make sense? Yes, of course. Wonderful. And experimentation is going to allow you to discover an optimal position of your pelvis, optimal distribution of weight on your feet. Wow. And you can use the neck as the gauge. Remember, I was working with Robert just a few minutes ago and I was inviting him to use his ability to play guitar as the feedback mechanism. Mm. Well, for you, it's just simply the sensations in your neck that will be an immediate feedback mechanism. So rather than trying to fix the neck, we actually begin to address the root causes. We understand that the neck is actually the symptom, but the root causes are further down below at the foundational level of the structure. So if the whole human body can be considered as a tall structure like a skyscraper, well, if the foundation of a skyscraper is crooked, it's not gonna be very stable. Mm. And it's obviously the roof of the skyscraper is not gonna be streamlined up, upright. Well, that's basically what we have to do. We have to address the underlying misalignments that do reflect themselves in a way that the head and neck feel. And I guarantee that once you discover that you have the freedom of choice and you start exercising this freedom of choice as to the alignment of your pelvis and distribution of weight on your feet, your neck is not going to feel the same. Does that make sense? Sure, absolutely, sure. Yeah. And another thing that I also encourage you to do is to use your breath also as uh, the uh, sign that you are becoming more relaxed or less relaxed. Just like with Robert working on his extensors of the wrist or fingers. The Tension in the erector spinae muscles affects your breath adversely. And when you discover a way to bring yourself into a more upright alignment, you will have an easier time breathing. You may even feel like, oh my God, I've been told to breathe deep all these years. Now I don't have to be told. I know how to breathe. I just need to allow that to happen spontaneously. I need to get out of my own way. Does it make sense? Sure, sure, sure. Great. Before we wrap up what we're doing, let me invite you to do one more funny thing. We've been doing all kinds of funny things, right? So mm -hmm. one more funny thing. Let's, let's see if you can grab the tips of your ears with your fingers. 
and just tug straight up towards the ceiling. Very gently and very slowly, pull the tips of the ears towards the ceiling. Basically, now you discover a neutral position of your head. It's not something that you're used to, and so you may feel really weird, like, oh, this is really strange. I can just walk around like this. Well, you can, because <laughs> this is the aligned position of the head. It's just situated, so you don't feel like yourself when you are in this kind of alignment. Notice how. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, but you live in Hollywood. Yes. There are many actors living in Hollywood. And, yes. and many uh, actors and other people in the movie industry and, and entertainment industry in general take Alexander Technique classes. Mm. Have you heard of Alexander Technique? Yes, I have, yes. It has a lot to do with alignment of the head and neck. And one of the things that I know about Alexander Technique is that they follow certain um, premeditated idea of where the head should be. Mm. Unlike Alexander Technique, what I do is I actually encourage to work on the whole body and just see how the head comes into alignment. But it's good to know where that alignment would be once you actually get into alignment. So you can just give yourself a reminder, okay, this is the aligned position of my head. Uh, goody, okay, how far am I when I'm in my, in my habitual holding pattern? How much movement do I experience when I realign myself? Over time, you will notice that there is less and less discrepancy between your habitual way of holding yourself mm. and this kind of alignment. So I'm not going to force you to carry yourself like this all the time because it would be contrived and you would only be able to achieve it by tensing up more. Now you would have right. twice as much tension. Who wants that? <laughs> Instead, you will release tension little by little by discovering what allows your body weight to rest on the skeletal structure of your skeleton on, on your bones including the noggin like we just talked about how it's relatively heavy so it needs to rest on the bone structure of the neck when somebody applies the pressure to the top of my head it doesn't even feel like pressure uh. and i'm applying pressure at about the same level of the weight of my head so just doubling the weight maybe 10, 15 pounds. If my head were just a little bit more like so, mm. and somebody applied pressure on top of my head, what would happen? Uh. <laughs> I would crumble. Make sense? Yes. So yes. just adding a little bit extra weight to the weight of the head already being held up by this misaligned structure would basically make this pressure collapse. So an image that I invite you to use is the image of those women in Africa ah, and the bowls. other places <laughs> where they carry things on their heads. Yeah. Sometimes heavy things, like a big a load resting on top of the head. If the neck was out of alignment, they would break their neck. How do they not break their neck? Oh, they bring their head in alignment first and then put the load on it. And then they walk around like this with the load on their head without crumbling. You don't have to carry a load on your head. You can just imagine having something heavy on, you, on top of your head. But that is going to serve as a reminder, as the um, kind of a, a visual aid in your mind's eye that, oh yeah, this is how I want to be, like those women who carry something on top of their heads and don't collapse. When they take this load off, they still walk around in that alignment because that's habituated and natural way of being for them. Can you imagine how your neck is gonna feel when you develop this type of alignment? <laughs> I guess, I guess I can imagine. Yes, why not? Yeah. So how, how is it going to feel? 
just free, I guess, free. We feel free. Free and... So this is going to be a nice piece of homework. <laughs> movement and checking with yourself. How does the change in position of my pelvis and distribution of weight on my feet affect the alignment of my neck? And when the neck is relaxed, it means the entire rectus spinae group actually is relaxed. If you don't have tension in the muscle along your spine, it means that there are no blockages that may very well contribute to all kinds of other health issues. Because there are two blood meridians uh, running down to the side of the spine. And that basically is um, part of the body that uh, can easily get stuck uh, or develop an energy blockage. And we don't want that, do we? No, no, certainly not, no. Okay, so this is gonna be a elegant and relatively simple practice, but it's not just fixing something, it actually discovering something. And that's something that means there is no end to it. <laughs> As you continue discovering more about yourself, the more you will be amazed at how much more you know yourself. And I think that's also one of the primary objectives of any school of thought that is worth its salt, knowing yourself. Of course, yeah. <laughs> huh. Did it answer your question? Uh, that's a great answer and it's good stuff to work with. Thank you, I appreciate that very much. And I, I will, after, we leave, after I leave this session with everybody, I will go do that. <laughs> Thank you. You're so welcome. All right. Well, uh, we have uh, some more time, folks. Anyone who wants to um, experience more uh, coaching, please feel free to raise your hand. Um, Marsha, just uh, put it, um, type it in chat. Please share your takeaways, comments, and questions by emailing qigongmasters at gmail.com. Thank you, Marsha. Brilliant idea, as always. All right. So let's see who else is raising hand. Peg, please feel free to unmute yourself. I, I know that you unmuted yourself now. Would you do me a favor and also turn the camera on so I can see you? Obviously, it's a lot easier to do coaching, this type of coaching, when we can see each other. Feel free to speak up and uh, tell us what you would like to experience as a result of uh, our coaching. I'm wanting to open my chest area. It sounds a little bit like your last uh, client and I have a lot of trapezius muscle tension. Um, and I used to be able to bend over backwards and really extend my legs on the ground and now I can't bend very much at all. And so there's this a blockage, I, I guess a lot of us have that in the uh, trapezius muscle area. And I've got a lot of chiropractor work. I get regular massages, take good care of myself. Um, but like a lot of people, I also use uh, devices where I'm leaning forward. Um, so uh, I'm not having any real pain, but I'm just not feeling the flow. And I really want to open my heart area. I'm a lay minister. And um, you know, there's so much tension with COVID and all of this stuff but i really want to open my heart and have more of a flow uh, and also use my voice more effectively so it's a it's the you know the shocker area uh, speaking my truth love that's i think what i'm hoping for more of oh, by the way where are you going from toronto ontario i would love to help you with that and one of the first things uh, let me just ask you a couple of questions about sure your issue. How long have you had this tension in your trapezius for? Oh, decades. How many? I would say. Um, well, let's see. Uh, two. Twenty years. Mm -hmm. Okay. And how did you start noticing that? Did it hurt, or did you just have some limitation in range of motion, or both? Both. 
Mm -hmm. okay. And only, only recently, as the chiropractor said, yes, your neck is, is much better. So I'm, I'm working through some emotional issues and uh, that's reflected overall in my body being more relaxed and now I, I just want a higher higher level of being absolutely yeah and uh let me ask you this mm -hmm. uh, you said that currently you don't experience any pain in your trapezes no in terms or the of neck mm -hmm. any degree of discomfort is there more discomfort on one side or the other side it, uh, actually, there's a bundle of nerves just at the top of my shoulder, yep. and I always ask the uh, massage therapist to go in there, and it's, it's, it's a, a twanging pain, and after pressing it for a while, it, uh, it subsides. I guess that's just where a number of the nerves reconnect connect together, and the, the cumulative pressure there. Applying pressure on the nerves usually is not the best approach. Simply harassing them into relaxation doesn't really work well. So one of the things that we always try to do is to understand why is it that mm -hmm. you are doing it. Obviously, you're not doing it consciously, but you- Unfortunately, <laughs> I can't stop it. No. So one of the easy ways to connect with that aspect of your consciousness that is doing it is to actually consciously do a little bit more of that which you're already doing. A very I'm not sure. strange idea. Yeah. Doing more of that which you're already doing. If you have tension in your trapezius, mm -hmm. I wonder if you can create a little bit more of that tension. You don't have to Well actually I did that. I, I was listening to you helping the fellow with the elbow and I thought, well I, I I'll just hold my neck like this for a yeah. minute or a bit right. and boy i got a much better range of motion yeah. from that mm -hmm. very nice so you're made a very good first step you, you also told it you had to the right when you did that yeah I, I can do it yeah both sides i did it i did it both sides yeah so the neck is much better but i do do i still hold a lot in here and partly it's immobility a lot of sitting i'm retired um so i uh, i don't know what else to say just uh can you help <laughs> yeah. obviously tension here uh, is the muscle called platysmus okay. yes a lot of muscles and i'm just starting to exercise those to kind of keep my you know my chin from uh, <clears throat> sagging and you know and also have sleep apnea and so i thought um exercising my palate and the tongue on all those muscle inside, as well as um, toning up the muscles of the whole neck will help to lift so that the sleep apnea from the drooping will be relieved and maybe cured. Indeed. That's just very recent, very recent. Okay, so let's see how we can engage those muscles that already hold tension in a little bit extra additional tension. We don't want to push them over the edge so that they would go into a spasm, obviously. But we do want to consciously engage the muscle in contracting on purpose. So how would you exaggerate? Like, for example, if you could reach through this computer screen and move my shoulder and my neck in any way, how would you need me to create similar or even greater tension in my muscles to, well, I would just, um, I would uh, tense them in one direction and so, hold it and then another direction and hold it like, like for the minute that you did with the elbow issue, um, put extra pressure on it. And so the neck realizes it doesn't have to be, I think it's a, it's a protective thing, protection. Yes, absolutely. It doesn't have to protect because I've got the muscle you know it's really there and it's strong so you can relax now well hopefully the muscle doesn't need to protect your head as the head learns how to sit on top of the cervical spine yes it, i do have to sit straighter we can support the head and then mm -hmm. the muscles of the neck can relax but it's hard to relax the muscles 
if they're tense unconsciously. And obviously, that's the unconscious tension that you're holding. You're not trying to hold it consciously, right? No. Well, if you're holding it unconsciously, it's probably hard to stop holding it because you don't know how you do it. Yes. So what we're going to do is we're actually going to engage in conscious contraction of these muscles. So, okay. like you said, you can tilt the head, for example, on one side and also bring one uh, shoulder closer to the ear. Very nice. Mm -hmm. the right shoulder to the right ear. And notice if you feel more tension in exactly those muscles that you've been uh, noticing tension in. Very good. That's a trapezius, you know. Well, it may be trapezius, but also and others. It very possibly is a, a, a much smaller muscle called the levator scapula. Right where you said at the top of the shoulder blade is not just a nerve bundle. It's also the point of insertion of a, a levator scapula muscle that originates That's, on the transverse mm. processes of the neck vertebra. And so basically what you're doing right. is shortening both upper trap. Oh, lovely. So I'm causing, a, I'm causing a conscious pinch before here. To, before you go to the other side, mm -hmm. I invite you to check if you notice any difference between the right yes. and the left side. Yes, it's more alive. The side is more alive and softer. So, aliveness is something that we want to celebrate and acknowledge. And we don't want to just jump to the other side because often it's hard to recognize how much benefit there was from a simple and elegant solution like you just applied. If one yes. side of the neck feels a lot more alive, well, then stands the reason you want to do that to the other side, right? Yes. Okay, so let's do it to the other side as well. And so I'm doing it with you. Mm -hmm. I'm shortening these muscles on the side of my neck. And we're gonna wait. Just like in the case with Robert, mm -hmm. we're gonna wait for a change in the breathing pattern. Obviously, cranking the neck like this and misaligning the shoulders is not gonna make breathing easier. It's gonna make mm. breathing more difficult. And your body will eventually say, you know what? I'm really sick and tired of holding this tension. I need to breathe. And then you'll be able to release this tension. And because you're holding it tension consciously, you mm -hmm. will be able to consciously reduce this tension. Mm -hmm. But what I invite you to do is not just to drop it like a hot potato. Okay. Yeah. We're holding <laughs> so that we're really becoming conscious about how this tension is created. Yes. When you create this tension consciously, then you can do something about it consciously, such as right. exercise, self-agency, whether to hold the tension or to stop holding. And when you feel like you're really sick and tired of holding it. Oh, breath. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Exactly what we were waiting for. Yes. And I've been noticing too that I breathe, I breathe shallowly. I have a, a thingy that measures my oxygen mm -hmm. percent saturation. And um, it's been at 91, 92. Ah. as I'm sitting and reading, but when I get up and exercise and it's back to 97. So ah. obviously there's something, I thought my diaphragm, uh, the muscle was, um, um, was you. kind of be, being weakened because I had done a lot of vigorous exercise, but it could be the unconscious holding. Um, and as, as evidenced by the, the big sigh I had with the shifting. Right. Yeah. And of course, also sedentary lifestyle is not the most healthy way to be. So no. if you sit a lot, no. it stands to reason that your body is basically feeling kind of scrunched. And yes, and, and I have a question too about walking. It might combine with the tilting of the pelvis. When I'm walking, uh, to be aware of how I'm holding my head and, and trying to uh, you know, find the, the sweet spot um, in my posture, so I'm, I'm not, you know, a lot of people lean forward when they walk. Um, so uh, yeah. I can kind of work those together, I think. You are absolutely right. Now, when I stand, I stand more or less upright because I've been mm -hmm. working. 
However, right. walking, I changed the alignment of my spine. So notice how it's almost like I start falling forward. Yes. I yeah. start tilting forward just by one or two degrees. Yeah. Gravity moves me. When I walk, yes. I just simply lean forward just a tiny little bit. But I don't do it hinging around the pelvis. I am doing it hinging around the ankles. Tilting and forward with your ankles. That's interesting. So not just the torso leans forward. Mm -hmm. the legs do too. And that basically means that the center of mass is no longer on top of the foot. It's slightly right. forward. Which right. means gravity starts pulling me forward. Now, if I don't place mm -hmm. the foot in front of me, I will fall on my face. I don't want to do that. So mm -hmm. I step. And then I continue this motion and let the gravity do the work again. And then I fall. That's, yeah. That's very subtle. I don't know if I can um, learn to just lean forward. First of all, be erect properly, and then lean forward from the ankles. What do you do? Do you keep your keep your back and everything straight and yeah. and just and just lean and just lean <laughs> lean forward <laughs> with a straight back? Okay, that so, sounds good. Yeah, well, it's, it's as easy as this. You're standing upright, straight, and then you just simply lean, and you have to walk. Otherwise, right. So that that's wonderful. I'm wondering if I might uh, excuse me for interrupting. If I might somehow arrange my cell phone to you could see my normal stance from the side would that be a good thing okay i'm going to try to find something that's high enough okay. oh she's holding back yeah if you check with the distribution of weight on your feet is there more weight on the heels or toes i'm going to take my sandals off here I think it's on the outside of the feet. How is it working? My, my weight is on the outsides of my feet. I always um, wear down my shoes on the outside. My hair is a bit, sorry, <laughs> got out of a nap. Yeah, so it's on the outside of my feet, which I always thought was weird. In terms of the of forward or backward distribution, is there more towards the front or towards the back? Yeah. Um, a little bit towards the back, I'd say. Yeah, exactly. So you actually have the opposite issue from Stephanie's. Mm -hmm. As she was holding forth, you were actually holding back. Yes, and I, I walk deliberately upright because I <laughs> want to practice getting those muscles of the back uh, stronger. Yeah, well, wherever do that it. idea from, mm -hmm. apparently was the source that did not factor into the uh, walking style. Right. Making but, it worse. Because if you hold back, mm -hmm. like I'm holding back now, my weight is distributed closer to the heels. I try to walk right. spinning my wheels, but I'm not really getting anywhere. Yes, well, you really exaggerated it. Did I look back at the stream? Almost. So, really? Yeah. Definitely, it looks like yeah. you hold back. Okay. And if you try to walk while holding back, it will require extra effort. Yes. Now, to hold myself up. <laughs> back. It basically holding back. You're trying to move forward, but your energy is actually going in the opposite direction. Well, that's a kind of a metaphor for how I feel spiritually right now, too. I'm holding back my voice. I'm holding back my where I put my energy. You know, with COVID, you have to. But I just haven't found a niche that allows me to um, feel comfortable uh, with, uh, with people who are not new age, even though there's huge wisdom. Um, I just can't find a place in my Anglican church. Uh, well, I certainly so would be to help you by offering you my coaching, if this is something that you feel like this would be an appropriate thing for yes. you. Yes. You know, when you first, when I, you first recognized me, I felt a, a very gentle energy coming between us. So um, 
I would love to do that, really. Great. I would certainly be happy to start working with you if you're interested. Uh, so feel yeah. free to simply uh, email me. Here is my email address. So you can just email me personally. Uh, it's in the where would I, where would I look for that? Um, in in the chat. more under more chat chat room. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's my personal email address. Um, Lama at tantrapa.org. Yes. Great. Thank you. you are and so how, how do you like to be addressed? Most people just call me Lama. It's short and simple. Oh, okay, sure. Obviously, Lama means a spiritual teacher in Tibetan. Perfect. And uh, that's a fine way to address somebody who is a Lama. Just like. And would you, would you mind just sharing your, your first name that your friends would? Your parents would call you so just believe it or not, my parents call me Lama these days. I'm actually <laughs> okay. coaching them because everybody needs to receive coaching and they definitely benefit from that. Perhaps in, in your church people might call you Reverend. Very well. Um, that's definitely a, a perfect example of how physical issues that we come up with often are a reflection of the way that we feel and with the way we use ourselves and the way our energy um, yes. expresses itself in our lives. So if you feel like you're holding back or being held back by something, well, of course, your physical body will reflect that. And basically what we do is we learn how to reconcile the discrepancies between how we want to be and how we feel so that we actually begin to feel and express ourselves more authentically and we stop being held back by anyone or anything. Yes, and that's a little compliment. I'm, I have a wonderful Jungian analyst and we're looking at how the persona, um, uh, social construct, how you want to see yourself and all that, how that um, can cause tension with how with how you really want to be I and mean, the, the worst uh, the worst the persona is is defined the often the greater distance the greater tension between who you really yeah, want as to matter be of fact, with the word persona or the word person to that matter or personality all come mm -hmm. from the greek word for a mask so mm -hmm. in greek theater actors wore masks apparently they were pretty insufficient actors <laughs> so they couldn't participate <laughs> without just wearing a mask so you know sometimes they would put a mask a smiley face sometimes they would have a, a sad face or whatever <laughs> so the personality is basically that outer layer of mask that others perceive that's yes. how you present yourself to the world and it's part i think part of the energy armor that i have that I'm feeling across my heart. Exactly. There is another thing, the inner layer of the mask, that which fits to your mm -hmm. face. That inner layer is what I call identity. It's who we identify with, it's who we think we are. It doesn't necessarily mean that's who we are, but that's who we think we are. We basically develop a sense of identity that may be different from our personality. Yeah, and like the a self-concept. Like you think you're a very kind and tactful person, but your friends would say otherwise. Exactly. And the greater <laughs> there's a discrepancy, the greater there's going to be tension and discomfort. Mm -hmm. Because something is not jiving in your world. I think I am kind and generous person and, and other people think that I'm a jerk. Well, there is definitely some disconnect. Yes. So then, And that's not me, by the way. I just wanted to correct that. I, I totally trust it. But the idea is that if we have this kind of disconnect, there's going to be tension in the physical body. Basically, mm -hmm. that's where that armoring comes from. Yes. Both from trying to pr protect ourselves from the judgments of others and also trying to fit into the expectations or impress other people or pretend to be somebody who we are not. Basically. Yes, this. yes, exactly. Exactly. That's what I'm doing at my church. I really like the people. I've been there 10 years. I do a lot of interesting things when we're, we're together. Beautiful, reverential things, lovely people, uh, beautiful music in a Gothic cathedral style 
church and it's uh, it, uh, so much is there for me um but i can't talk to them about uh you know the shift um how we're moving into the age of aquarius and all that stuff all the wonderful uh, dna upgrades and uh, new energy coming in and i'm just I can't share that it's, to me that would so cool thing i could get that it would be hopeful and freeing uh, but they're very restricted in how they speak to God yeah. and uh, how they pray. And uh, I just feel I'm, I'm in a place for a reason. I'm there for a reason, I think. And maybe it's just, you know, in five years, there might be something for me to do there. I think it's a very key church for the, for the Anglican Church in Canada. Very key. It's the largest uh, congregation, Anglican con congregation in Canada. So uh, just having to be patient, and I'm getting tired of that. I'd like to find another, uh, an additional milieu where I can uh, be creative again. Right. Uh, being patient, obviously, patience is a virtue on one hand. On the other hand, it means that you've been holding yourself back. Yes. It's a lot of work. It's frustrating. And at times, I feel as if part of me has died. Ah. Died. Okay. But it's not. It's just sleeping it will come to life again like the trees are going to soon. <laughs> Understandable. Yeah. Well, this is definitely something that I would love to help you with. Thank you so much. Thank you for the time. Thank you all for listening to this. I hope some of it is relevant to other people. Absolutely, yes. And uh, um, the, the, as I mentioned before, I love working with people who touch lives of others because that gives me an opportunity not just help one person at a time, but actually extend uh, influence through uh, the work of the other people uh, to all the other folks in their congregation or in, in their community. So that's something that I would definitely love to help you with. And that's perfect. I, I wanted to just share briefly. I, I was a psychotherapist for quite a while. I retired from that. And now I'm, I do spiritual guidance. I've been doing it for about 20 years. But that's all that I do. And yet I'm feeling that there's not a fit between how I see things and how most people who come to me see things. It's too much of a, a difference between the language I would like to use and the language that they, with which they are comfortable. So it's frustrating. So we will get together. That's terrific. Thank you, for, uh, thank you Mama, for this. And uh, thank you again. Thank you all for listening to me. Well, I want to thank you, Peg. Uh, and also uh, thank you, Stephanie, and, and thank you, Robert, and everyone else who participated today. Um, this has been an enlightening and uh, uh, empowering event for some of us. I certainly experienced a little bit of enlightenment just sharing what I had to share and uh, uh, spending some time with individual folks who volunteered to be in the hot seat. And I see Marsha is raising the hand. Hey, Marsha. Hello, I just want to make sure you let people know where they can see the replay of today's training and to reinforce where they can write you the, to share their comments and input and ask questions. Absolutely, yes, thank you. That is very important that um, we stay connected because that's somehow uh, been challenging uh, during this pandemic and uh, obviously uh, we want to maintain a sense of community. We don't want to feel like we're doing it all alone. And if we can congregate face to face, well, let's do it using the modern video communication techniques. So basically this is something that we will definitely do more of. To connect with me directly, please feel free to email me at lama at tantrapa.org. If you want to share any comments, takeaways, or have questions that you would like to ask, please email qigongmasters at gmail.com. Both of these email addresses are in the chat, so just feel free to click the chat and look them up. And uh, if you have any comments or um, feedback about what we've just experienced today, I saved a few minutes, uh, so feel free to unmute yourself and uh, express what you 
appreciate it or take away from today's experience or perhaps something that you still wished you would experience but you haven't. And, and where will they see the replay of this? This replay will be available on uh, our Facebook groups, Qigong Network, as well as Tai Chi Network. Both of those groups uh, I'm a creator and moderator of. And we also have a really cool group called Flow and Thrive. A year or so ago, when this pandemic happened, I realized that people want to know how to be more in a flow and that's what would allow them to thrive better. Well, how about we create a community on Facebook called Flow and Thrive? That's exactly what we did. And um, we have a thriving community, 500 plus people and uh, other groups are even larger. So all of this will be available for replay in those Facebook groups. Also, if you are not a Facebook user, but you would like to get access to it, you're welcome to visit my YouTube channel. It's, I believe, just simply youtube.com slash Tantrapa. Find my YouTube channel. I hope that you will enjoy this video as well as many others that are on it. So if anyone has any questions, now would be the good time to ask any questions about Qigong, Tai Chi, spirituality, healing, internal martial arts, meditation, anything that you find related to uh, these disciplines, feel free to speak up and uh, ask anything you want. I have a question. Yeah. Hi, Stephen. Hi. Uh, I should have raised my hand earlier. Uh, it was good to hear about the neck problems because with my chronic stiff neck, so I'll work on some of that. Uh -huh. Two other questions. One is, I had a dental implant. The implant was no problem at all. When the other dentist screwed in the crown on top, I thought, oh, that's kind of tight. Uh, I had him go, go looser. I had him take it out for two weeks and then put it back the next time without using a wrench. Ever since he did that, there's been a pressure in my head all the time. If I'm stressed, I feel it more. If I'm absorbed in something, I don't notice it. But it's every day. Kind of a pressure here. Light, but intolerable. It's tolerable, but uh, hey, man, every day it's crazy. <laughs> That's over a year. Yeah, so how long has it been for? Uh, over a year, maybe two years. Wow. So how are you handling it? Uh, just uh, don't bother about it. <laughs> it's just accept it. So basically, it doesn't bother you, but um, you just notice that sometimes there is pressure. There's like a slight pressure constantly. If I'm if I'm really absorbed, I don't notice it. If the implant was in the upper jaw or in the lower uh, jaw? Uh, the lower jaw. Yeah. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so the, it might have. Um, affected your trigeminal nerve. Yeah. I'm not a dentist, so I'm not gonna make a diagnosis, obviously, but I know that um, it does happen sometimes. It's, cu it's curious that neither the, the implant dentist or the guy that put in the crown, both of them have no comment. <laughs> huh. They have no idea what's going on. Fascinating. Well, um, obviously, they're just uh, specializing in very narrow field that they're experts in and whatever else is outside of that scope of practice they just don't want to talk about that yeah to me, to me it's obvious they pinched the nerve it's like there was a oh <laughs> my, other, my other question is uh i've been diagnosed last year with severe arthro arthritis in the in the left hip uh I don't have much pain in, in the hip, maybe a little bit sometime, not, nothing to be concerned about. But the result seems to be that the, the left leg thigh muscles are, are really kind of messed up to the point where I'm limping. Are you feeling tension in the muscles of your left hip? Uh, not particularly, huh. not so bad. But the muscles are, well, the muscles are all tight, yeah. 
Well, that's what I'm asking. So if the muscles are tight, that's something that I definitely would be able to help you with. And it may very well have positive effect on the arthritis itself because arthritis and inflammation go hand in hand. And if there is tightness, it often is associated with inflammation. So basically it could very well be a, an elegant way to help your hip recover from arthritis. Now, one of the ways that I would work with that is again, to engage those muscles in mindful contraction, but doing it consciously and only going to the edge of the comfort zone, not push the muscles beyond the edge of the comfort zone into discomfort or pain or spasm. Uh, obviously, I would be happy to work with you if you're interested in experiencing this. So let me do this. Um, since we are at the end of our coaching clinic right now, let me just invite you to uh, book a session with me. I'm not going to charge you anything. I'm just going to give you my attention and see how much progress we can make in one session. Fair enough? That's great. I'll communicate by email. Well, what I'm doing is I'm actually just uh, typing in the chat box. And you're welcome to go to this website address and book an appointment with me. Okay. And this is something that applies not only to Stephen, as a matter of fact, everyone on our call is entitled to experience it, either with myself or if there are too many requests, obviously I will have to ask some of my apprentices to step up to the plate and help out. But we want to basically reward everyone attending our event today by giving a complimentary coaching session, something that normally we charge money for, and we're not gonna charge anything for this session at all. You're welcome to sign up at this uh, website address I just posted in chat, calendly.com slash Dantrapa. So feel free to pick the date and time that works for you, and I will look forward to working with you. Thank you very much. You are very welcome. Well, thank you, Stephen, for speaking up. I definitely appreciate seeing you, and uh, we'll look forward to talking to you in our session. Very good. Anyone else would like to uh, bring up anything that you wish uh, we covered in our coaching clinic today, or something that you wish you heard and you didn't hear, or perhaps something you heard that you wish you didn't hear? We covered a lot of ground today. I appreciate everyone's time and attention, and uh, you being here today means a lot to me. As I said, as a gift, I want to offer you a complimentary Qigong coaching session, and I will look forward to seeing you there. Until then, namaste.